There is something special about an original, and today will be a celebration of a watch that began my appreciation for mechanical timepieces, the Rolex 5512, a watch that was the foundation of the line that cemented itself as the Submariner, and the final iteration of a design that we would come to know and love years later. For some strange reason, unbeknownst to me, I've always been drawn to the originals of things. I own five pairs of Levi's 501 jeans, two pairs of Ray-Bans, Sebago dock siders. I built a Fender Stratocaster and own a 1968 Volkswagen Beetle. And what ties these things together is that all of these products have their roots grounded somewhere in the 50s and 60s. Those were very interesting years in our history, especially from a design stance. We could base pretty much what we see today from principles that were established back then. And adding to that, the Submariner also found its footing at the time. I distinctly remember watching reruns of Connery's Thunderball and Moore's Live and Let Die and being enamored by the watch when I was young. And growing up, I didn't even know what Rolex was, but the design of the watch stuck in my head for decades. It was one of those designs that doesn't really leave you. And as cliche as it sounds, this design is one of the greats, one of the most iconic wristwatches of all time. So in 1959, the Submariner had been established as a commercial dive watch, one of the go-to watches for professionals and amateurs. Yes, it wasn't the first. That merit belongs to the Blancpain 50 Fathoms, a watch that I did a video about a few months ago. The 50 is such a remarkable watch. I truly respect it. And you should too, if you know that it was a watch in military service while the Submariner was still being window dressing. But regardless, the Submariner had the marketing and had already made a big splash in the commercial and professional realms of dive watches. After being in development for five years, the design team took a bold step forward to improve the form of the watch. And to explain the evolution, we'll have to go back a few years. When we look at some of the original cases, like for example the case of the original Turnograph, this watch was a prototype in the purest sense. There was no designated function for the watch originally when it was produced. It was, for lack of a better word, a gimmick. And you can see in the original brochures that this watch was supposed to be universally used as a cooking timer or a long distance phone call timer. The case was tiny, sitting in the realms of 37 millimeters in size. It was basically a date just oyster case that had a strange bezel attached to it. And as we know, the foundation of this watch sparked the creation of the Submariner and the GMT, two watches that became extremely successful, but they too had small cases originally. This was an interesting time because a new genre of watch was being established, an amalgamation of a dress watch and a sports watch. Nowadays we see them as two separate things, but back then there was an impression that a sports watch should double as a watch that would work well with a suit. The concept of a dressy sports watch is what this watch managed to arrive as, but then a few years later after its establishment, the watch was demanded to perform more intensive jobs, and so the style and the form of the piece had to change to cope. Ironically, the trend is returning back to the original intention of these pieces, since people nowadays, more often than not, are wearing sports pieces with any outfit. Standing beside the likes of the 6538, it's clear to see that the evolution of the next generation was quite drastic. In the creative industry, this would be a big deal, an overhaul, not so much an improvement. What's interesting is that these two watches are to scale. The 6538 on the left is considerably smaller, with a small bracelet and a shorter lug length, and then looking at how the 5512 changed, it adopts a beefier case with increased thickness, a bezel with greater knurling, and crown guards. This watch virtually transformed at this point, and the Submariner had arrived in the modern era. So apart from becoming a watch that we know today, what made it so interesting? Well, I would argue that this was a time when this model was experimented on the most. First, the biggest highlight of the watch when it launched was its crown guards. They were marketed to give the already well-secured screw-down crown added protection. The story goes that the 5512 was originally conceived with square guards, and as you can see in the pamphlet, they look stunning. I actually wish that this form of guard had stayed, because they really do complete the watch and make the fitting of the crown to the case look a lot more finished, but looking at it now, it does appear rather overbuilt. And it was soon realized when the watch was used by professionals. Why a diver would need to screw and unscrew the crown with gloved hands is beyond me, but apparently they complained that the process was difficult to perform, and the square guards evolved into the guards that we are accustomed to seeing. In between this time, during the improvement process, a different, more attractive guard was tested, and we know it now today as the Eagle Beak. They are very rare and sought after models. And as they became slimmer and transitioned more, we saw the watch exhibit pointed crown guards, 
It really is bizarre seeing the evolution of such a small thing. Then the case. It is interesting to think that this was the first real time that the case was beefed up so much in the watch's history. The only time the case would see an increase of such large proportions again would be in the 2000s when the maxi case was introduced. And adding trivia to that, there was a point in time when there was a minor increase for a very select few pieces. And that was when the 5514 and the 5517 pieces were made for the British military, the mill subs, a group of watches that have become unicorns in the collecting community. They were required to meet different specifications, one of which being thicker lugs to accommodate the watch's fixed spring bars. These were watches during the height of their prototyping phases, and they really do look impeccable. This whole time of developing this case shape is fascinating to me, because it was a style that remained for almost 50 years after the fact. On the left we have the 5512, and on the right the 14060, the last great hurrah of the original case shape. It's remarkable that this format became the iconic shape that would be implanted in our minds when we think of the Submariner. It must have taken a lot of trial and error and mock-ups to finally come to the conclusion that the lugs needed to be a specified length and width. And the final result is gorgeous. I think this is the reason why we appreciate the design of these cases and the cases of the five-digit references in general. The tapering gives us the impression that these were planned out, that giving only what was necessary makes it all the more attractive and subtle. Other interesting innovations during the time of the 5512 came in the way that their dials were arranged. It really feels like this was a time when the concept of everything goes was at its height. For example, the early models, or should I say the transitional models, came out with explorer dials. These were strange references, and of course are highly sought after today. Some models of 5512s were sold with red triangles on their bezels, and I'm sure these inserts were just carryovers from references like the 6538 Big Crown that you saw earlier. Then we had the different formats of paint on the loom plots, and how the markers and fonts were arranged. Some of the models had gilt dials, and others had non-gilt dials. That you can usually tell if the text on the dial is gold or white. Also whether the watch had a railroad minute track or not. All of these nuances are videos in themselves, but it is unreal to think how many iterations were implemented at this time. Also the transition from radium paint to tritium paint, and how these loom plots faded over time in different colours, and then how the paint on the dials would fade, and spider, and patina into a chocolate colour that is known as tropical. If we look at the bracelet at the time, it was carried over from the earlier references. The rivet bracelet catches a lot of flack, and I have gone into detail about its evolution before, there will be a link to the video in the corner of the screen now. But this bracelet also saw a change during the time of the 5512. But what made the original rivet bracelet so interesting was the way it integrated into the case. To this day, I still don't believe a bracelet looks as good as the original rivet end link does. It forms so neatly around the lugs and makes the transition look almost seamless between the bracelet and the case. And you have to admit, they look cool, right? Then, as the reference moved through the 60s, the watch received hollow end links that were easier to manufacture and simpler to operate. The Oyster Bracelet is a really fascinating bit of development history. All of the above has merely been a rough guide through the aspects of the 5512, and really this is the core fundamental that makes it so fascinating to me. This watch went through such an overhaul while it was in production, and was a watch that established the final design that would see the Submariner through to the modern day. It was a time when Rolex had passed the initial stages of bringing the Submariner to market, and now that they had an audience, they threw everything at the wall to see what would stick, and in doing so, created some of the most beautiful sports pieces ever made. It was a watch that broke the mold, and it just goes to show that development can take time, but after feeling out the playing field and coming up with a winning formula, a design can remain and continue to remain. And seeing how it stands tall next to its generations of offspring, still looking prepared to go to depths that would easily kill the wearer. Without a doubt in my mind, the 5512 is the most beautiful Submariner ever made.